When Typhoon Tip reached its peak intensity on October 12, 1979 in the West Pacific, it became the most powerful storm ever recorded. Its wind speeds peaked at 305 kilometers per hour. Gale force winds extended from its center in a radius of 1,000 kilometers, making it the biggest hurricane or typhoon ever recorded. And it was nothing compared to the storm which is tearing the sky apart over my head right now. To understand that storm and why it's going to bring freezing temperatures to much of the Northern Hemisphere, first we need to backtrack a little bit and talk about how we divide the atmosphere into layers. Typhoon Tip, like all storms we experience, was trapped in the bottom layer of the atmosphere, what we call the troposphere. We divide the atmosphere into layers depending on how the air temperature changes as you go higher and higher up. Close to the ground, if you go higher up, the air temperature decreases, it gets colder. This is the troposphere. But when you get to about 10 kilometers above the surface, this breaks down and as you go higher, the air temperature stays about the same. And then if you keep going higher, the air temperature actually increases. This is the stratosphere. The air here is much thinner than in the troposphere, but it's much bigger. It's huge. It stretches from 10 kilometers up to about 50 kilometers up all over the Earth. And it's home to the most powerful storm in the world the stratospheric polar vortex. The polar vortex exists because every year the Earth's winter pole doesn't receive any sunlight, making it extremely cold, while the equator is still very warm. And that difference in temperature drives a huge circulation in the stratosphere. Air starts to rotate around the pole, forming a circulation that's about 6,000 kilometers across. This thing is the size of a continent, and it moves quick. The typical wind speed of the vortex which forms in the northern hemisphere is over 200 kilometers per hour, but it peaks at well over 400 kilometers per hour, making it way faster than any typhoon or hurricane. And the vortex which forms in the southern hemisphere is even stronger with a typical wind speed of over 300 kilometers per hour. Now, you'd expect a donut of air the size of Asia, rotating at 200 or 300 kilometers an hour to be pretty strong and stable. And most of the time that's true. It forms every single year and it dominates the circulation in the middle atmosphere. But every now and again, about six times every decade, it spectacularly falls apart, like it's doing right now. Starting on about the 9th of February, the normally pretty strong and coherent polar vortex started to deform and tear itself apart, splitting in two. Instead of having one giant rotating mass of air overhead, this is getting out of hand. Now there are two of them. This event is known as a sudden stratospheric warming. And the one that's happening over my head right now is going to influence weather across the Northern Hemisphere for the next month or two. Now, I'll get to how in just a second, but first, you might think because it's called a warming that it's going to make us warmer at the surface. But actually, it's the exact opposite. The sheer violence of the circulation splitting apart causes the air over the pole to get squished down towards the surface. And that compression results in significant heating. To put just how much heating into perspective, the room that you're sat in right now is probably about 20 degrees Celsius, or 70 freedom units. If I were to increase the temperature in your room by, say, 10 degrees Celsius, then you'd definitely notice it. It would be going from room temperature to shorts and t-shirt weather, like summer here in the UK. If I was to increase it by 20 degrees Celsius, then it would go from being room temperature to an Australian summer. While if I increased it by 30 degrees Celsius, it would be more like the very hottest parts of the Middle East. But when the vortex splits apart, the air in the stratosphere doesn't warm up by 10 or 20 or 30 degrees Celsius. It warms by 50 or 60 or 70 or even 80 degrees Celsius. And as the name suggests, this happens quickly, in a matter of days. Imagine your room going from Siberia in winter to the Sahara in summer in less than a week. And this very month, parts of the polar atmosphere have warmed by over 70 degrees Celsius in less than a week. 
Now remember, this is happening about 40 or 50 kilometers up, where the air's less than 1% as thick as it is at the surface. And yet, these events are so violent, possibly the most violent events in the whole atmosphere, that they still have an influence, a very real influence, on the weather that we experience. For about two months after a sudden warming happens, we see that storms tracking their way across the Atlantic are deflected further south, and freezing cold air that's normally held over the Arctic by the strength of the polar vortex is able to penetrate further south and spill towards the equator, bringing extremely cold weather. Research actually co-authored by my PhD supervisor has shown that in the aftermath of sudden warmings, there's an increase in extreme cold, and we can expect something similar to happen over the coming weeks. Why this happens is something of an unanswered question that my PhD thesis actually tackled. There are different theories to explain the downward influence of the polar vortex, including waves being reflected off the bottom of the vortex, new circulations being created by the wave breaking, and far field effects of the vortex itself. My thesis, for what it's worth, looked at the last one of those, and found that there's a subtlety in how the polar vortex interacts with the troposphere and the surface. Basically, the surface is only affected by the polar vortex if the troposphere is willing to accept, it's in a configuration to accept that influence. But this is an active area of research at the moment. There are so many questions that are still unanswered, like what's the mechanism that connects the stratosphere and the troposphere? How can we use knowledge of that mechanism to improve surface forecasts? And how is that interaction going to change with a warming climate? For the time being, we do understand the basics. The vortex splitting apart will probably make its influence felt on the surface around about now, and that influence will stick around for a couple of weeks. Arctic air is going to be finding a new home further south. After that, the vortex will gradually reform in the stratosphere and the atmosphere will go back to something approaching normal. But if you're going through a cold spell in the northern hemisphere right now, you might be able to blame the most powerful storm in the world splitting the sky apart. If the idea of these big unanswered research questions has whet your appetite and you're interested in following in my footsteps and researching the atmosphere, then a great place to get started is brilliant.org. In particular, their Out in Nature course is full of problems about how physics influences the natural environment. In my opinion, learning science is all about applying concepts that you've learned to practice problems, and then, if you get those problems wrong, identifying your misconceptions. Now, this is exactly what Brilliant is all about. It gives you a bunch of practice problems, and so it helps you identify your misconceptions. And then, crucially, it helps you correct your understanding. So, if you want to have a go at this and look through some physics problems, go to brilliant.org forward slash Simon Clark. And the first 200 people to click on that link will also get 20% off their premium annual subscription. If you would like to learn more about the subject matter of this video, then consider checking out some of the videos I made during my PhD on the subject. And if you'd like to learn more about how I made the visualizations in this video, well, I didn't. They all came from earth.nullschool.net, a free website which is updated every day with current atmosphere and ocean data. I highly recommend you go and have a look, have a play, it's super easy to use, and it shows how amazing the world around us really is.